They were Iranian buskers playing in a <coughs> shopping centre in the middle of Tehran in Iran. And you don't get a lot more British than what they were singing, if you recognise it. The Iranians love the British. They love our music, they love our football players, they even love our politicians. But I don't feel that the feelings are reciprocated. <laughs> so this evening, I'm here to talk to you about my experiences living and loving in Iran. And I hope that you go away from this evening understanding that Iranians are people just like us. So why am I speaking to you this evening? First of all, I've got a strong belief in the truth. And um, I don't believe in telling lies, I don't believe in telling half-truths, and I don't believe in a lot of the spin that goes on, and certainly in regard to Iran. Second reason I'm here is because I'm saying no to war with Iran. I don't want to see Iran being another Iraq and the mess we've left that country in. I don't want to see Iran being levelled like another Syria. I think we can always find diplomatic and peaceful solutions to our, to our challenges. And the third reason I'm here, to be very transparent, is that my wife is Persian, my wife Sara, and together we have a little girl, so she's half Persian, and I'd love her to grow up knowing her family in Iran and not watch from a distance seeing them killed and uh, dispersed from their own country. So that's, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm here. What am I going to talk to you about? First of all, I'm going to talk to you about my experiences in Iran. So I'm trying to sort of present it as a day in the life of, of me in Iran. Uh, I'll talk to you about family and friends. I'll talk to you about our safe escape from Iran. I'll cover a little bit of history and then I'll make a movie recommendation at the end. So where's Iran? Hopefully most people know it's out in the Middle East and it borders with countries like Turkey, Pakistan, Turkmenistan and Iraq. Uh, Size-wise it's about 636,000 square miles, so it's nearly seven times the size of the UK to put it in perspective. And the population is about 83 million, so it's about a third more than the UK. The main resources in Iran are oil and gas. And Iran has actually got the fourth largest proven oil reserves on the planet behind Canada, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. So you might be able to understand why there's quite a lot of interest um, in Iran from other countries. The main religion in Iran is Shia Islam. And it's worth noting there's somewhere between 350,000 and half a million Christians living alongside the Muslims peacefully and in harmony in that country. Um, fun fact for you, friends, um, Iranian friends in the UK know uh, Iran as the capital of nose jobs. So if you're in somewhere like Tehran, you'll see people out and about with little sticky plasters or bandages on their nose. And they wear these with pride because it indicates they've had some work done. And for those who can't afford a nose job, often you'll see a sticky plaster <laughs> or a bandage. Anyway, so what's my experience in Iran? Um, I met my wife five, six years ago, and I went out to Iran initially about four years ago. The first time was for a holiday for two weeks, and I did some travel also down from the Caspian Sea down to Tehran and as far as Esfahan. So I saw cities, I saw some towns, and I saw some villages, I had quite a variety. And then more recently, I went out this year and I lived there for two months, um, staying there, studying as a student. And I was studying Persian, or Farsi as it's known, so that we can bring up our daughter bilingual. My wife speaks to her in Farsi, and I want to learn as we go along as well, and be able to integrate with the family in Iran better as well. So I'll talk you through a day in the life of Jason this year. First thing I'd start off with was with uh, Daddy Daycare. I'll be looking after our little one um, after my wife Sarah went to sleep um, doing the night shift. This is where we lived. That's an apartment block that my uh, father-in-law built about 20 years ago. And just to give you a bit of a view of what, how, how we live, this is our sort of main living room. There's lots of different living conditions in Iran. I guess this is middle of the road. I went to places that were, that were a lot more luxurious and I went to places that were a lot more modest. So people live in all different conditions just like we do in our country. And this was the view I treasured every morning when I left the apartment to go to university. Um, you can see the snow-capped mountains there. Tehran is actually circled by mountains. And in April and May, when I'd be going out in a t-shirt, people were still skiing up there. It's quite a big pastime, um, certainly for people who live in Tehran. So what did I do after I'd done my morning shift? I went off to university to study. And I was studying at the Dehoda Lexicon Institute, which is part of the University of Tehran. It's one of the best places you can go to, to study Persian. They do cover other languages as well. Um, I studied for three hours a day and five days a week. That was actually in the classes, and then there was extra work to do outside that. 
That's our classroom, fairly modest. Um, any one time there's usually about 15 of us studying and I met people from all over the world. Um, some people were there for business reasons, some people were there for family reasons, some people were there because they were living with their partner and they just wanted to learn the language to integrate better. But the one thing we all had in common is we all got to love Iran and we all had nothing, nothing more than positive things to say about the people that we met. So after university I'd walk home along what I called the Green Miles. A lot of people I meet think that Iran is just a big desert full of sandcastles. Well, it's, it's not. It, it's very modern. Certainly Tehran's very modern. And Tehran is also very green. My walk, which was about 45 minutes, was literally trees all the way. And it gives uh, welcome shade during the day. Um, also, you can't see it too well on these photos, but there's gullies that run along a lot of the streets in Tehran, which, is, which are bringing water down out of the mountains as the snow melts. So that really adds a nice atmosphere as you're strolling along. Um, the only downside for me is all the pollen as a hay fever suffer, sufferer. Um, it's carnage at the time of year I was there. <coughs> Just wanted to show you a little bit of the sights. So when I wasn't studying, um, I was spending time with family. I was out doing a bit of sightseeing and I was just doing the general day-to-day -day chores and stuff as well. So this street was just around the corner from our apartment and to me it looks like pretty much any European street that you would see. The architecture is very similar in some places. Of course, there's the historical things which are very different to what we see here as well. This is our supermarket. Looks like a co-op or a Tesco's that you might see here. This is the bakery. So uh, around Tehran you'll see lots of holes in the wall, little windows and some special buildings as well, peep in and you'll see these guys cooking fresh bread and this is, bread is a real big part of the food in Iran so you go along and get your fresh bread every day or every other day and yeah it's delicious, highly recommend it, there's lots of Persian restaurants in this country so take a look. This is a, a view um, from the north of Tehran, from the mountains looking across to the south, this is an afternoon that we had with family, we went to an American sort of burger and steak restaurant and sat listening to a 70s funk and soul. Um, this is a new shopping centre in Tehran called Barmland. You probably liken it to some of the up and coming places in Dubai for example. Um, it's very up to date, very modern, lots of designer brands, lots of nice eateries. So in some respects they're following a very um, western sort of way of life and it's something we're very familiar with wasn't quite up my street because I like to go and take in some of the culture, but it's just to show that there's a lot of similarities with us. This is the um, Nature Bridge, which was designed by two female, young female architects in Iran, and it spans a big dual carriageway and connects two parks in Tehran. Um, just to show really the capabilities and the architecture they have, and you can't tell very well on the photo, but this, this is double decker and there's actually some restaurants and stuff on the, on the lower deck there. And this is the Millard Tower. It's about 430 metres tall. It's actually the sixth tallest tower in the world. And it stands very proud of the Shard. The circle bit at the top there is, has got various rooms in it, but there's a big revolving restaurant and you can spend an hour at a buffet doing a full 360 and looking out over Tehran. Absolutely stunning views. When we weren't sightseeing and doing other stuff, I studied, so this is my textbooks here and a little bit of Farsi I was writing. And once a week, as students, we tried to get together to discuss our experiences. So this is out, us out at lunch. Um, food is a very big part of living in Iran, so I'll get on to next. Another big, big thing for us, big, a lot of time was spent, um, was with the family. There are really strong bonds between family members in Iran, and getting together, having food, spending time together, together is a really important thing. So I'd get home from university thinking, oh, I'm going to sit down and do some study this afternoon. And the next thing you know, you're getting whisk whisked off at a moment's notice to go to a cousin's or an uncle's or an aunt's and, and get some food. Uh, here's, some, here's a picture of some food um, with relatives. We held a little gathering in our apartment. And this is at my father-in-law's. I can't tell you how kind uh, family and friends were in Iran. Uh, for example, we didn't have a washing machine, so people would come over in the car, pick our stuff up, take it away, and later on we'd go and pick it up. Or if we needed to go somewhere or we wanted to see something, there were always people willing to help us and just be really kind. Even down to non-family members, like you get in a taxi and you get chatting, and, and people are so welcoming and just want to get to know you. 
that, so it's the same with friends as well. You know, everyone's very, very kind. So this was Sarah's cousin's birthday and we sort of had a bit of a surprise for her and took a cake along and that was them singing happy birthday in Farsi. One of the things that happens quite a lot certainly in Sarah's family is after the family have gathered and had their lunch together and had a chat, people will start singing, people take turns to sing, people will get instruments out. So it's a really nice way of bonding and spending time together. So that sort of wraps <laughs> up what I do in a typical day. I want to talk to you now about safely escaping Iran. So while I was in Iran, I visited the British Embassy a couple of times. And I want to talk to you about how I felt uh, when I left the embassy after my second visit. Now, I can't tell you what, I was, what was said to me in the embassy, but I can tell you how I felt, and I can tell you that this comes from information that's relayed down from the highest of highs through different people and interpreted in different ways and sort of comes out to the person at the bottom in a, in a message which you take away. So I left the embassy feeling scared. I felt scared for my wife's safety. I was under the impression that she would likely be questioned on leaving the country and could end up um, like some people that we've heard of in prison. I discussed everything in detail with my wife and she said, well, I haven't done anything wrong. <coughs> Why are you being told these things? Why is this your understanding? And she said, as, as much as the British government says things about the Iranian government, I don't believe that there's any risk to me. So I'm going to leave the country as I normally would and anyway, I want to test it and actually see if the Iranian government is as bad as people say they are. So we left the country, no questions were asked as we went through security and we got onto the aeroplane with hundreds of other dual nationals and left the country without any problem. So I guess what my message here is that we can't always believe everything we're told and we should question people's motivations and we should understand about more about the situations um, that people are in and the situations that are being explained to us before we make decisions because fear is a really powerful thing. So in that respect onto a little bit of history, um, you can go away and read a lot of this on the internet so I'm not going to delve into too much detail but some of the things that stick out. Uh, back in 1953 there was a coup in which a democratically elected government was removed and replaced with a Shah and there was a lot of western interference in that particularly by the US and the UK. In 1979, there was also a revolution where the Shah was removed and replaced with an Islamic government. And again, there was Western interference in that from the US and the UK. Today, we're seeing tri crippling sanctions uh, in Iran, started by the US and now contributed to by the UK for the second time. And I can tell you from personal experience, they're not pleasant. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the first one, when we arrived, my wife's friend had lost her job because the company could no longer function in Iran because of the sanctions. Six months on, she's still out of work. Uh, second example, I met someone who had links to the UN while we were out there. They were running projects, um, humanitarian projects, looking after refugees who had got into Iran from other countries. So Iran was hosting them. And because of the sanctions, uh, the UN was struggling to get money in. So what happens when you can't get money, you can't run your projects and you can't look after people. And the third example, we went to a pharmacy. We were only getting some sort of skin cream on prescription. And the lady in the pharmacy said, you're two days too late. We can't get it anymore because of the sanctions. Now, that's a small example, but four years ago, my wife's um, mum was dying with cancer and she couldn't get the food supplements she needed. So I actually helped my wife in this country pack food supplements into a suitcase to take to her dying mother. That's what sanctions do, they do not tackle governments, they harm and kill people and it's, it's horrendous. So if you want to learn a little bit more about things that have been going on, I'd recommend this movie, Q53. I haven't seen it, it's sort of in, um, what do they call it, in sort of uh, movie fairs and that kind of stuff at the moment, but I think it's going to be hitting screens soon, so keep a look out for it. There's the details there. I've been watching as it's been edited and published and put together and stuff, and it does look very, very good. I'll try and end on a couple of movies of my own. <laughs> this is the 
this is how young people in Iran, or certainly in Tehran, meet each other. So girls go out in their cars, guys go out in their cars, and they cruise around Tehran streets, and they find people they like the look of, and they'll pull up alongside each other and exchange numbers and uh, possibly meet later on. And I'll end on a bit of music. I started. This is a bit of folk song, which was in the park around the corner from our apartment. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>